Good evening. Uh, as we go to our lesson to, to this evening, let's first uh, go through it via discussing a occupation. And that occupation is the uh, job of a referee. Uh, have you ever thought about how difficult the job of a referee is? I referee myself, uh, have done it for over 20 some years, uh, in certain sports, all the way from college to all the way to, uh, 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 peewee baseball. Amen. And I come to tell you, if you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen. Uh, referees are needed though for every sport to bring fairness to the game. But referees are criticized by coaches, players, fans, and commentators. They're scrutinized by almost anyone and everyone who is watching the game. They're second guessed, they're mocked, teased, and sometimes even blamed for a team's loss. But referees must work together as a team to effectively officiate a game. They must trust each other to have knowledge of the rules. They must work together with integrity and skill to enforce those same rules. And the decisions that they have to make must be quick and direct without hesitation. But the contest we will speak of tonight that Jesus was called to referee was no game at all. <clears throat> at stake was Jesus' reputation and a woman's life. And this passage is one of the most memorable encounters in the Bible. It's the gospel illustrating Christ's compassion and Christ's wisdom. This passage also reflects the grace of Jesus Christ. This story is about a woman caught in adultery. And tonight we'll be coming out of the book of John chapter 8 verses 1 through 11. And the Bible reads, Then everyone went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives was a common stop for Jesus. He would go there when he was in Jerusalem. He routinely took time to be in his father's presence. And that's a, pl a good place for all of us to be, is before God in prayer. What, the, what is it saying? If you're going to worry, don't pray. But if you're going to pray, come on somebody, don't worry. So the Bible says that early the next morning, he went back to the temple. All the people were gathered around him and sat down and began, and he, began to teach them. So, most people rose about sunrise, and the temple opened then. And the religious teachers and leaders often taught in the temple courts. All the people gathered suggest that they were, were eager and prepared to learn from the master. Maybe they were motivated through recent experiences or word of mouth about what what an outstanding teacher that Christ was. So during this time, the Bible says that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught committing adultery. And they made her stand before them all. So this event happened in the temple after the Feast of Tabernacles. The teachers and the Pharisees had interrupted the Lord's teaching. They dragged the woman to the front of the crowd, pulling her while she was defiant, fighting, and resisting them. Can you just imagine the state that this woman was in? Her clothes were in disarray. Her hair was all disheveled on her head. And naturally, the crowd turned to see exactly what was happening. But their star, when they turned their heads to see, added to the woman's humiliation. And surprisingly, the crowd had no respect or even cared for her embarrassment or her, her feelings. 
they show the accused woman no compassion. So this entire scene is very intense and intriguing. So the teachers and teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they, they threw the woman on the ground before Jesus and made the adultery charge. The woman's accusers now must have been eager to humiliate her, wanted to do it on purpose. Because now they had the option, they could have kept her in private custody while they talked to Jesus in private about the matter about this issue, but the teachers and the Pharisees handled this matter in public view, openly. So after they had dragged her there and threw her in front of the crowd, they said, teacher, to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now one might ask the question, why would Jesus' enemies referred to Jesus as teacher. So we must assume that this was said, said in sarcasm because actually the teachers of the law and the Pharisees didn't believe that Jesus had the authority to teach. He's the son of God. But they questioned his, even his authority to teach his father's word. So the Jewish teachers and Pharisees were avid enthusiastic about the law of having of witnesses, about having the witnesses to, to a crime. It was crucial to them to note, to make known that, that this woman not only was an adulterer, but she, but she was caught in the act. But, it's always a but, isn't it? But they didn't bring the man who deserved to be executed too. Understand this, under logic, if the woman was caught in the act, she wasn't by herself, correct? So the man should have also been uh, observed and caught and brought with them too. But this brings up an inter uh, interesting proposition. It may suggest that they use the man to entrap the woman. In other words, the man back in that time might have been a paid gigolo. Maybe that's the reason they didn't bring him. Pay, maybe they paid him off and let him go. So the first thing go, go on to say, in our law, Moses commanded that such a woman must be stoned to death and then they said, now Jesus, now what do you say about it? So the teachers and Pharisees of Moses' law devoted their lives now to learning the law of Moses. They had many years, even started out young, many years of training and, and scholastic debate about Moses, the law of Moses. And also, it was mandatory that they tried to live that the law of Moses faithfully every day. And in their feeble minds, they, they probably thought that they no doubt believed they had an edge, an advantage over Jesus regarding the law because they thought they knew more about it. But again, the Jewish leaders had already disobeyed that same law. How did they do that? Well, it's because they arrested the woman without the man. Remember the law of Moses said both adulterers were supposed to be taken, apprehended and stoned or executed. Both, not just one. So again, the law required that both parties to adultery be stoned. So our Lord found himself again in conflict with these same Jewish religious leaders. But this time, not only was he in conflict with them, but they wanted to set a trap for Jesus. They were hoping to get enough evidence to arrest Jesus. 
For example, an example of the law you can, be, can, can be found in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. And it reads, The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Here's another example of the law of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22. And it says, If a man is found lying, mean laying down with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die. The man that lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall put away the evil from Israel. So, the, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they said, said this, again, to trap Jesus, asking him, what does he think? Should the woman be stoned according to the law of Moses? Again, they were trying to set a trap for Jesus so they could accuse him. But he did something strangely. Instead of Jesus answering them, which they were anticipating, the Bible says that he bent over and stood writing on the ground with, with his finger. So, the leaders were using the woman as a trap, again, so they could trick Jesus. Again, if Jesus said the woman should not be stoned, they would accuse Jesus of violating the law of Moses. And if Jesus said the opposite, if he told them to execute her, they will report him to the Romans. Understand the situation in those days that the Romans didn't permit the Jews to carry out any public executions. But this wasn't the only time now, if you look through the Bible, that the religious leaders tried to trap Jesus. For an example, I want to go to Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 18, and it reads, the Pharisees went off and made a plan to trap Jesus with questions. Then they sent to him some of their disciples and some members of Herod's party. Teacher, they said, we know that you tell the truth. You teach the truth about God's will for people without worrying about what others think. Because you pay no attention to anyone's status. Tell us, then, what do you think? Is it against our law to pay taxes to the Roman emperor or not? Jesus, however, was aware of their evil plan. And so he said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? What's going on here? Well, if Jesus agreed to pay taxes to Caesar, the Pharisees would reject him. They would say he opposed God. And God was the only king that the Pharisees recognized. And if Jesus rejected to pay taxes to Caesar, the Herodians, which are folks under Herod's reign, would arrest him. And they would hand him over to Herod to be charged with rebellion because he refused to pay taxes to the Roman state. So Jesus avoided this trap by showing that we, talking about believers, have dual citizenship. And the further example of that can be found in Matthew 22, verses 19 through 22, which is a continuation of the last verse. Jesus said, show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a Daenerys, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar's what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. So this this passage says that, that we are our citizenship in the nations that we live requires that we pay money. We, we must pay for the services and hopefully the benefits we receive from being a citizen of a nation. 
but our citizenship in heaven requires that we pledge our faith and our loyalty. So back to the lesson. And as the teachers of the law and the Pharisees stood there, amen, understand that Jesus is now writing on the ground, looking toward the ground and writing with his finger. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are standing there steady asking him questions, waiting for that answer. Then it said that Jesus straightened up and said to them, Whichever one of you has committed no sin may throw the first stone at the woman, at the adultery, adulteress. So, Jesus didn't exactly address the issue that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law presented. And that was whether the sinful woman deserved to die by, as the law of Moses said. In fact, what happened was the issue of whether the sinful woman should die faded back into the background. Jesus went into the very heart of the matter. Jesus' challenge was if any of these men were without sin. Now understand, it was common in Jewish teachings that even the most pious, meaning the most religious, had sin. Further proof, you can go into scriptures, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, and it said, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Meaning you've fallen short of God's standards. So the point of Jesus' words was that they were not qualified the teachers of the law, all the Pharisees, they were not qualified to judge this woman. And their hypocrisy stood out, was, re was, was revealed, because they only brought the woman. And again, the law commanded that both the man and the woman were guilty of adultery. So this passage gives a significant statement about judging others. Jesus upheld the legal penalty for adultery, which is stoning. He upheld it. So they couldn't, he couldn't be accused of being against the law of Moses. But he said that only a sinless person could throw the first stone. But this, by this, he highlighted the importance that we all should have of compassion and forgiveness. When others are caught in sin, the question is, are you quick to pass judgment? If you do, you're acting like you've never sinned at all yourself. Now, don't get me wrong. We must speak against sin, but from a spirit of humility. Again, we go back to Romans Chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Be careful. When we find ourselves feeling angry about somebody else's sin, our role, our role is to show forgiveness and compassion. It's God's role to judge. It's not ours, my friend. Often, you, have you understood, often the sins we notice that others are the same sins that we're guilty of ourselves. For example, a person who gossips, you know anybody that gossips? May be very critical of other people who gossip. Especially if those are, who are gossiping, those same people are gossiping about them. Then the Bible says, then he bent over again. So he stood up, Jesus stood up, said, uh, brought to them well, the, one, the one that has not sinned, cast the first stone. Then he went back to the ground and continued to write again with his finger. So it is uncertain whether Jesus was just ignoring the accusers, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. Maybe now. The question is, what was he writing? Maybe he was listing their sins. Maybe he was writing, 
out the Ten Commandments. Maybe Jesus was writing an accusation against all of the accusers. Just maybe he wrote the sins of each of them on the ground. Jesus' statement was a reminder to all of us that even the religious and the most powerful are guilty of sin. So, the teachers of the law on the first, when they heard this, when they heard what Christ said that the one without sin cast the first stone, the Bible said that they all left one by one in this order. The older ones left first until Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing there. So Jesus said, Jesus said those who hadn't sinned should throw the first stone. The leader slipped quietly away from oldest to youngest. This may suggest something about wisdom that comes with age. Maybe the older men were more aware of their sins than the younger. But whatever your age, take an honest look at your life. Recognize your sinful nature. Again, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, short of God's standards. Recognize your sinful nature. Look for ways to help others rather than hurt them. The religious leaders had come to discredit Jesus, to tear down his reputation, to catch Jesus in a trap. But they got caught up in their own trap and left without a sound. What's that saying? If you dig one ditch, you better dig two. Because that, that next one, other ditch might be, just might have your name on, might be for you. So, Jesus straightened up after everyone had gone. The woman was still there, standing accused, and said to her, where are they? Jesus knew where they were. But he wanted to further the conversation with the woman. Is there no one left to condemn you? Understand the men who left are also the only witnesses to the crime. You remember I told you that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees were very big, were avid about having witnesses. So they, when they left, they were the only witnesses to the crime of adultery that they were accusing the woman. And without witnesses, no one was left in the crowd to initiate the punishment or, or to throw the first stone. The witnesses were normally the first to throw the stones. But understand this. In that the, the law of Moses, it also said, but if you were found to be a false witness, you would pay the same penalty that they were about to flick on their victim. So if they get ready to stone the woman and they found out that they were false witnesses, in return, the woman could get rid of whoever, and, and they could also, they could be stoned themselves. Again, that was under the law of Moses. So the woman responds when Jesus asked her, where, where are they? Is there no one to, to accuse you? She said to the master, no one, sir. Well, then Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, but do not sin again. So this woman was guilty of sin according to the law of Moses. Which said anyone caught in adultery was to be put to death. So the question may be asked, is Jesus reversing the Mosaic system? No. He's placing his cross in between that woman and her sin. 
Understand that later he's going to the cross to pay the penalty for sin. The Bible said that he didn't come into the world to condemn it. He didn't come to judge this woman. But he came into the world to be this woman's savior. And so often many people think they're lost, deserted, and no good because of a certain sin that they've committed. But I come to tell you the good news of the gospel that no one is ever lost because they are a murderer, liar, thief, adulterer, etc. Why? Because a person who does these things, I've just mentioned, because they only do it because they're lost and they don't believe or know Christ. And any person who comes to believe in Jesus Christ is forgiven. Simply stated, Jesus Christ forgives sins. He is our Savior because he died for the sins of the whole world. Jesus didn't, con didn't condemn the woman accused of adultery, but neither did Christ ignore or condone her sin, meaning he didn't agree with her sin. Jesus stands ready to forgive any sin in our lives. And with Christ's help, we can be forgiven and stop our wrongdoing. His forgiveness is the greatest gift. Remember, I said the greatest gift, meaning there's no other gift that's greater that you can ever receive. Accepting God's grace doesn't mean we just sin less. But receiving God's grace means we sin no more. Jesus wanted her to repent and leave her life of sin. And Jesus offers us a choice between death in sin or eternal life in Christ. So this encounter, this story, this passage illustrates Jesus' role as the example of grace and truth. It reminds us of the unlimited love, compassion of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This verse challenges us to examine our own hearts and attitudes. It challenges us to evaluate our behavior regarding sin and forgiveness. Jesus extends forgiveness and mercy to the woman, but not excusing her sin. He offered her the opportunity for repentance and change. Repentance is confessing to Christ and turning away from our sins and never addressing or revisiting, revisiting those sins again. We thank you. Hope you enjoyed this lesson this evening. Subscribe to our channel for more Christian content. Thank you and goodbye.